This week on CrossFeed. On a lot of stuff that we remember 9-11. For example, no pastors on Patriot Day. But they helped 10 years ago. Is the cross trash? And Proposition 8 is back. And Muhammad gets a sequel. Hello, everybody, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. And not only is Proposition 8 back, but we're back, too, after quite a hiatus as I was on vacation and uh, uh, um, worked at my, I did my daughter's wedding, and she is happily married for about a month, and then... We I got back from that, and then we had something else happen, and then we had, oh, I know what it was. We had a just a little hurricane up in this area, and um, that would put us out for a night. And then uh, after that, we had Labor Day weekend, so we've been gone for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty chaotic around here too. I can't really get into it, but uh, it's it's been uh, pretty bizarre um, in my neck of the woods. So. But, um, He's from Ohio. It's always bizarre in Ohio. <laughs> but so, um, so you and I both did uh, something special for uh, September 11th today. Um, we uh, we had a, a special service this morning uh, that we invited the local police and fire departments to come. Um, as it turned out, uh, the police weren't available because they were all on duty, or um, and and our policemen only get uh like one weekend off a month or something like that and um and so it was, they just had a hard time getting anybody actually here they said they would try to send somebody on duty but he wasn't able to make it uh we had we did have an assistant fire chief come and um and we presented them with plaques and um and uh some the biggest gift baskets i've ever seen uh, one for each, uh, we have two fire stations and one police station, and they had a gift basket for each of the stations. Um, and then we had a, a big reception that we were hoping that, you know, we'd have a bunch of police and fire, uh, uh, workers there. And, and, and since none of them came, there was a whole lot of food left over. And so then they, and it was, it was mostly pastries and things. And, and so we boxed all that stuff up and people delivered that to the, um, to the departments along with uh, the gift baskets and the plaques mm-hmm. and everything. So um, it was, even though they, they didn't come, uh, they were still, uh, will, you know, benefit from it. So we were happy to, mm-hmm. to say thank you to them. We had a memorial candlelight service this evening because we, uh, this morning was our rally day with the Sunday school starting up. So we had a lot of different things going on. And so, uh, we had the honor guard from our local police department came. So it was six policemen, and then we had a reception for them afterwards. And we didn't know how many was going to come, so we decided, and, and the, the fire department and police department were both fairly large in Dedham, so we couldn't do anything like you did with the, the baskets and stuff. But we prayed for them, remembered them, and they all, you know, were, were thanked me. They did a lot of them actually said, you know, remember when the planes took off, a couple of planes took off from, from Boston. So they had a big commemoration mm-hmm. down in Boston this morning at 6.30 in the morning. So they've been going all day. So, but at least our places had pastors involved. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. All right. uh-huh. So th- most of you have probably heard that um, the, uh, the commemoration ceremony uh, today, um, as we're recording this on the 11th, uh, did not have any pastors. That all clergy were omitted from the ceremony. And they actually had a separate service at, where was it now? Diagon Alley! Uh, no, I lost it. Um. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I had it here. Anyway, they had a they had a separate service at which um they were uh clergy were uh uh kind of led the whole thing. Um 
okay, I have two feelings. Okay, the one hand, um, it would have been nice had clergy taken part. On the other hand, I have a uh, um, sneaking suspicion that if they had, they would have been neutered in their prayers, uh, and you would have prayed to whoever's out there, if anything is out there, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Um, you know, and that's the problem is it's it's pretty hard to, and I know in the Missouri Synod, I think that there was a collective sigh of relief um, that there wasn't any clergy there after, you know, for the Missouri Synod, the, the biggest impact of, of 9-11 was the, the huge controversy over the fact that one of our pastors did participate in it and, um, and whether that was appropriate or not. And, and it was, it's, it's something that's still going on today, um, being, uh, argued about although things have died down a bit since then i mean i have would have no problem you know well i have no problem in a threatum type thing where each person is you know you go up and do you have your five minutes and you do whatever it is you're going to do um and that i would be able to make a strong statement as to uh, what I believe Jesus has done and where, who, who he is, where he is in this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my confession can stand up with anybody else's. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases like this, there's this real push to basically say, well, it's, it's the same God no matter what we do. And so uh, uh, we're just going to get real mellow with this. But what was really weird is not only was no clergy invited, but there's no room for the firemen either. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. We don't have any room for firemen at this thing. You know, ten years ago, there's room for three hundred and some firemen. Very same place. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I just I can't get over that either. That that uh, uh, you know, I mean, okay, I could have just you know, you know, maybe you want to avoid any controversy, so we're going to ban the clergy. You know, ban the clergy. Although you know, I, I I don't you know I don't get it. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, you know, but then you you ban the firemen too. I mean, who's this about them? Right, right. Oh, I know who wasn't ba- banned. Mayor Bloomberg. He was there. <laughs> Except he wasn't there because he wasn't the mayor at the time. Um, but but he was there this morning. Yes, you know? he was there this Everybody morning. Else banned, but he was there. No, he wasn't there ten years ago. So, um, uh, I'll yeah. You know, as you pointed out, clergy were there ten years ago. Firemen were there ten years ago. Mm-hmm. So, oh, it was at a the alternate service was at a cathedral, the um, the seat of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. Um, oh, well, Washington yeah. Cathedral. But the yeah. only um, clergy at that event from a Christian uh, tradition were the Episcopalians who run the National Cathedral. Right. Yeah. And so, so which that resulted in all sorts of debate because. Yeah, they said, well, they should have at least had a Baptist to represent the evangelicals. Or somebody know. to represent the evangelicals. Or, or somebody, yeah. And, but they, you know, but it's all right because they had a Buddhist nun. Um, I mean, so here's a, I, I think that the, the controversy over who was and wasn't at the, um, at the alternate one does express some of what Bloomberg may have been afraid of happening. That you know, who do you pick to make sure you have a good representation? And 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 I look at this, and I look at the debate about whether you know they should have pastors at at the main one or or whatever. And and personally, I think that they probably should. Okay, but at the same time, when people sort of, especially um, pastors and and leaders of of various uh, denominations or or whatever, get kind of bent out of shape about it. That I have a problem with, right? Because while we may have the right to be there, we as Christians, as representatives of the church, really shouldn't be sort of crabbing about what our rights are. Um, Because really what we should be about is service. And so, you know, I was thinking about this. Okay, what's the appropriate way to respond to this of not being included, right? Find a way to serve. Right. Find a way 
you know, to help out, to uh, say, okay, that's fine. Instead of going to the service, we're going to do a nationwide, you know, help your neighbor kind of thing. And I know that there was a, a push to, um, to make today a sort of active service day, find a, you know, help out something in your community. But I don't think it had anything to do with, uh, I, I'm not sure who was, who was promoting that, where that started. Um, but yeah, I, I really think that, you know, we, how we as a church should respond is, is to respond with grace and, and say, um, okay, well, I, you know, while I don't agree with that decision, I'm not going to sort of flex my muscles. I'm just going to, I'm going to say, okay, that's fine. I'm just going to go serve my neighbor and, um, you know, and, and I'm going to show Christ's love. So. And we're going to tell the mayor he's an idiot, but that's not a <laughs> That may well be the case, but we're going to love him anyway, because Jesus loved no. idiots like me. Anyway, so, uh, um, but, uh, you know, well, I, I, you know, I don't think it's that hard. I, you know, I think when they did have the Prayer for America, they did a very good job of that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they're at Yankee Stadium 10 years ago. They could have done the same thing, but again, you know, um, but it doesn't make any sense when you think of all the people all the pastor clergy that were involved. Um, I remember when I was, because I was doing my teaching at the time. I started, that was the year I started uh, teaching, uh, uh, teaching in Bronxville on Saturdays. And, um, my last class I was supposed to have, they were, they were, they were having a service for one of the firefighters. And I mean, you know, they, were, they, they couldn't find a church big enough. So they were holding it in the gymnasium at Concordia, Bronxville. And, uh, I had to get there super early. Had to send in stuff to be checked out because uh, Hillary Clinton was going to be there and Rudy Giuliani were going to be there. And it was just a huge thing. Also, it needs to be remembered that the very first victim of 9-11, victim 0001, was um, a Catholic priest who uh, sacrificed his life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, racing into one of the towers to minister to the firefighters. Right. So, you know, it just... You know, in some ways, it's just a, a real slap in the face. Mm-hmm. I know uh, one of the pastors, Lutheran pastors I knew, Bill Reedy, he went right, he happened to be down that area right when it happened. And he took a bottle of, um, uh, he had a, he, anointing oil, and he was anointing the uh, firefighters as they were going in. And I had another friend, of my, one of our pastors from up here in New England, um, uh, was uh, ministered to the people at the uh, 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 at Boston Logan, because a lot of the people from the American Airlines gates who saw these guys were just, you know, really, you know, and I saw them acting suspiciously, um, you know, were overcome with guilt that they didn't do something. Um, and so he was, he ministered to them and then he spent some, a lot of time ministering down at 9-11, uh, down at Ground Zero to the firefighters and stuff who were, who were working and doing their stuff. So, I mean, clergy were involved in so many different ways. That there's just no way to take this other than a slap in the face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. You know, so that's all it is. Um, and I can't see it any other way. But again, something tells me the way this guy handles things, that if he did allow them, he would have given them uh, a hey you up there if you're really listening type prayer um, and forced them all to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, hold on now, you know, um, moving on. Uh, Interesting enough, we talked about religion and, and 9-11. There's been a study that says, um, I, I love the way this words. As the country marks the 10th anniversary of 9-11, a new study purports to show the benefits of religious involvement or spiritual belief in coping with long-term impact of the event. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean... <laughs> um, I mean, I just love that. It purports. You know, it, it, uh, it doesn't really show that. It just says it shows that. Well, all right. So uh, I think it's important as we look at, as we discuss this article, uh, to note that it is in the Jewish Daily Forward. Um, so it's, it, the article, you have to kind of, if you're not Jewish, you have to kind of sift through it because it's definitely Jews at the target audience. Uh, for the article, it's it's not, you know, it's, it's nothing against Jews or anything. It's just that they're the target audience for this particular article, and and it just, right. I just happened to um, 
to find this particular one discussing the topic. Right. But, okay. The idea that people who are religious would be able to better cope with this and would be able to deal with it long term. Anybody who's read Viktor Frankl would know this. You know, because, and Viktor Frankl was Jewish as he went through the whole, uh, um, uh, you know, little Holocaust thing and talked about the fact that those who were religious, like himself, were, you know, had a meaning and purpose in life, got through the trauma. And as the people who had no hope, who had no uh, uh, purpose or anything in life, were the ones who tended to despair and die. I mean, I would like to see maybe you talk, you know, not just this going, that this is quite congruent with what Viktor Frankl said. Mm-hmm. You know? Um... You know, as she says here, um, uh, you know, um, we know uh, uh, um, that uh, participation in religious organization gives people social contact, so it gives them the opportunity to have people to talk to. Uh, another way in which religion plays a role is helping people with a particular worldview make sense of tragedies. It gives a sense of meaning and purpose. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, very nice brain. Yeah. I, it was funny the yeah the the look at that um concentrate pinky concentrate if if scientists are to study the connection between religion and health uh Richard Sloan um uh professor of behavioral medicine at Columbia University Med Center um he said uh is it the fact that belonging to a community drives away a sense of isolation and where beyond church might a person access community? In other words, okay, hmm, people who go to church are benefiting from this. Uh, what do we do for people that aren't going to church? You know, instead of saying, well, maybe people want to go to church. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it well. in- there's an implicit message here in this paper and in many papers in this area that religion and spirituality are good for you. They're, you know, and I think that they're good for your mental health and your physical health. I think that's misguided and dangerous. Well, okay. Um, and you got that out of the, you know, we wouldn't want to tell people that spirituality is good for you. You know, it's ridiculous. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. Yep. I, I think this is, you know, uh, uh, well, the conflation of religiosity and spirituality with health is bad for medicine and bad for religion. Uh, if religion is meaningful to people and calls them to, and, and, and it calls to them, nobody would dispute the value of that. But to use religion or spirituality as a transaction through which you can attain good mental health, physical health is offensive to religion, or at least it ought to be. Why? Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't really expand on it. You know, uh, um, I mean... Uh, you know there are there are benefits. That, I mean, there have been study after study that find that things like prayer, meditation, are give various physical benefits as well and, and mental benefits, mm-hmm. other than just the spiritual side of things. I mean, that's that's been shown again and again and again. Um, I guess you know, uh, um, you know, religion. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, religion is uh, um, good for your mental and your physical health. Well, um, who started a lot of hospitals? Mm -hmm. You know, who were the ones who started the orphanages? Who were the ones who, you know, cared for the sick? I think that was religious people. Yeah. I mean, you know, people don't like to admit it, but, you know, you look at, like, the Red Cross, right? There's a reason that it's a cross, you know? It may be a secular organization now, but it didn't start out that way. Um, another uh, professor of psychology at Bowling Green says, uh, you know, um, and she's a leading researcher on the impact of religion in overcoming trauma, says it fights right to a larger body of research that shows that religion can have beneficial effects. For the most part, religion and spirituality seem to be significant resources to people when they're experiencing major life trauma. Spiritual, religion and spirituality are sources of help rather than harm, and she happens to be Jewish. Um, 
Uh, now, on the other hand, she points out that you know you should not prescribe religion, right? But um, you know, if there's somebody who has been religious and kind of maybe lost contact with that religion, it could be good. You know, uh, maybe you need to explore this. Maybe you need to get back to some of your roots again, right? And you know, and and here's the thing that you know, and I think about this when you talk about things like, uh, um, oh, let's take tithing as an example. All right. Um, all right. So I tithe and, and I love it. And, 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 and actually a lot of it has to do with Jim pushing me to do it. <laughs> and, um, and, and I, and I resisted it not because I didn't think it was a good idea, but because I didn't think I could. Um, and, and I, I finally started doing it and, and I realized that not only could I, it, it, it was, um, the, the, how how could I not? And and it's not that. And 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 now I mean financially I'm better off than I was when I started. But I, I'm not sort of treating God like a, a a stock, you know. Well, I'll just invest in that and I'll you know reap these financial benefits, right? Um, but rather it's it's you know I, I see that as as just God taking care of me and. And letting me know that he's going to keep on taking care of me, but you know, through that and and just the what I had to go through to get to the point where I was able to do that, um, just had a um, it, it it's brought me closer to God, just in the sense that um, I trust Him more now than I used to, and and I'm able to be um, to be just more comfortable with my giving and. And everything else, and and so it's it's had just a tremendous impact on me. I can't like tell people you should tithe, um, and 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 you'll be glad you did. I mean, I I, I kind of can, but at the same time, you can't just tithe for the sake of tithing, you know. And and so it's it's about it's about getting reconnected with God. You know, prayer is kind of the same thing that. It's it's about you know um, okay when you the more you pray uh, the more likely you're gonna find your prayers answered okay not because if you if you pray enough that that God will listen to you um, and you can manipulate God but because the more you pray the more you get in touch with the will of God the more that God bends your will to match His. And then you start praying for things that God actually wants for you, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not you know I said you're not manipulating God, you're um, God's manipulating you in a sense. He's or manipulating is probably a bad word with modern connotation. Um, God is forming you and molding you, you know, it's sort of potter and clay kind of thing. Or as we would say down down from Missouri, whittling God's whittling you. <laughs> you know. As I you know, like tell people and, you know, uh, asked the guy one time who was whittling, whittling something out of wood and I could think of a little, little elephant and how do you do it? Oh, I start with a piece of wood and cut away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. <laughs> you, know, and, you know, God, you know, cuts away everything that doesn't look like Jesus in our lives, you know, to mold us to make us more like him. Um, but I, I just don't, just don't see how it goes and how that works. Uh, well, as long as we're dealing with clergy and First Amendment, we might as well deal with this. this is kind of an interesting little article here, I thought, uh, about the uh, uh, guy wanting... Oh, well, okay, yeah, one of the big things, of course, about Ground Zero is the cross at Ground Zero. And uh, that uh, it is still there, which, by the way, was rescued by an LCMS chaplain. He was the one who really pushed to have it uh, uh, you know, erected for people and everything, I found out. I thought that was kind of an interesting story to come across. Didn't know that. I knew a lot of the story about it. Didn't know a LCMS guy was really behind a lot of that. Uh, but somebody had built, set up his own 9-11 cross in his yard. And um, they uh, had a, a real battle about it. This is in Livingston, New Jersey. And the um, guy put up this cross and everything. His name was uh, Patrick Racanello. Actually, he put it up to, to celebrate Lent, mm-hmm. and he put a cross on a tree in his front yard. 
And uh, he had a lot of neighbors get very upset about this. And then the town came after him. Good thing he didn't have a lemonade stand with it. He really was in <laughs> trouble. Uh, and he said uh, they, because his display violated an ordinance in the town that prohibited postings on structure, including a tree, that are, quote, calculated to attract the attention of the public, unquote. Now, I don't know what you would put up in a place that wouldn't attract the attention of the public. <laughs> Boy, that must be a really boring neighborhood come, like, Christmas time. Yeah, really. <laughs> no, Christmas lights, you're getting Christmas lights out of structure, and it's calculated to attract the attention of the public. No, nope, can't do that. All right. <laughs> Ridiculous law. Uh, well, yeah, and uh, so he set up a, a lawsuit um, from the Alliance Defense Fund, and uh, they said, we're going to haul you to court. They're saying it's a vague ordinance, and uh, you probably administer it in an ad hoc manner. In other words, um, why don't you walk us around and show us everybody who, you know, um, it's something that garners attention. Uh, do you enforce it every single time? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, you know, you know, and so, you know, you don't enforce it, you know, in some cases, but you're enforcing it in this case. Um, so anyway, um, it was probably a case. They at least had a lawyer who was in, in this town who was smart enough to realize we're, if they take us to court, we're going to lose. Yeah. Um, you know, boy, they, I'm sure the court will find in this guy's favor. Uh, we haven't been, you haven't been consistent enough in, in, in following it through. Uh, it's not, yeah, it doesn't have the language you need. Um, and what's going to happen is we're going to lose the suit. He's going to get to put it up there, and we're going to have to pay out a bunch of money to his attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, so they uh, came up with an answer instead. They said um, they would, uh, um, you could do whatever you want so long as it's not in a right of way. Um, um, so, uh, 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 so you cannot put up a notice or other postings on a structure. As, um, you, you can do it so long as those are not in, within public right of ways, including a 10 foot buffer that extends from curb lines onto pri pri private property. Now, interestingly enough, by the way, his this particular tree is actually in a right of way, but they're not going to say anything to him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I, I, my favorite part of this is the fact that um, the ordinance is part of the code's anti-littering section. So, so I, I don't know. You know, Halloween's coming. I'm just, you know. Imagine, you know, we've got some, some places around here that when we go trick or treating, like every year, we make sure to go to these places because, um, they really, you know, sort of do up their yards and everything real good. And, and we also have to go check it out. This one particular cul de sac that, um, there's like three different, three or four different houses. They all kind of compete and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm just imagining. <laughs> Oh, you're second, littering all um, over your um, yard. Halloween is second now, only to Christmas. People go all out for Halloween, just like they do Christmas anymore. But, uh, so... Uh, it's so sad. Well, Halloween's getting so commercialized. Yeah, I know. Uh, but I, I, I give... It's interesting, because all they did was added six words to, to the town code. And, you know, um, they, they, they took care of the whole thing. Uh, I have to give the this town of Livingston credit. They really stepped back and said, okay, this guy's got some really good points here. Let's not fight this. Let's just make the change we need to make, make it legal, and move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the it's guy good. Says, I, you know, the, the guy's whole thing lawyer's happy. Goofy to begin with. The guy says once he, you know, um, and yet the lawyer says he's happy. He says, I'm sure my client will be happy. Um, so it's just, you know, took, I mean, the, would that other groups in these situations that we've come across be so grown up? <laughs> yeah. Can we just like yeah. sit down and discuss this like adults and, you know. Right. You know, I mean, um, 
You know, I mean, we've had other cases where, you know, school officials or something and felt, you know, tight to it. And you're like, oh, the only thing they're going to do is spend a bunch of money on lawyers and they're going to lose because this is pretty settled law. Um, at least this case, they, they, they sat there and said, okay, we're going to just take care of it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm moving, move on. And I give them credit for doing that. Ah, uh, let's see. Well, there's a, the other two are six, one, half dozen of the other. Okay. Well, let's but, do the prop okay. eight one. It's, it's pretty short, really. Because... Okay. Cause I, I was going to, I wanted to, I was going to do the other one. I thought, you know, uh, uh, the new, the new Muhammad, because he said the new message was going to be delivered today. Yeah. And he's going to do his yeah. internet map broadcast. So it would fit in right with September 11. Well, we'll, we'll finish with him. Um, the, uh, uh, Proposition 8 is back. Um, in a sense, it might be back. Um, California Supreme Court said that it won't stand in the way of a showdown over the state's ban on same-sex marriage. Well, they um, signaled that. They haven't made it dis- actually made the decision yet. Right. They're, they need to decide. So, okay, so here's just, just for clarification. This is the current state of that whole thing, that there is a, um, a group uh, called Protect Marriage, um, that is, that wants to represent the state on this issue. And so the big debate is, can this organization, which is a lobbying group, represent the state? All right. Well, I, there's a little bit more to it than that even, because, uh, what happened was, is, um, um, when Judge Walker ruled Proposition 8 was unconstitutional, um, Jerry Brown and uh, the uh, and and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jerry Brown said we're not going to appeal this because Arnold Schwarzenegger really couldn't we we know now we didn't know at the time really couldn't take a stand for marriage. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, well, and then we found out that this this, this district judge himself was in a uh, a, a gay relationship, um, and. You know, which, which, you know, ask, ask some interesting questions then. Um, but anyway, but, um, I mean, the majority of Californians put this through, you know, and it was very unjust for them to sit back and make the decision and say, no, we're not going to enforce it. I mean, your job is to enforce the laws, even if you don't like the laws. Mm-hmm. Your job is to defend the laws, even if you don't like the laws. I mean, that's what you're elected for. If you don't want to do that, don't don't get the job. You know, I mean, unfortunately, uh, 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 I can think of Christian people who have been, you know, elected to offices and have to support, uh, um, uh, for example, abortion providers in their in their jurisdiction and make sure the laws are enforced. They can't sit there and say, "I well, don't like these laws. I'm not going to enforce it, mm-hmm. or I'm not going to support it." I mean, that's that's not the way you play the game. Anyway. That's what they decided. So this um, uh, Project Marriage, who, by the way, are the people who paid the money and who did the work to get Proposition 8 on the ballot? Mm-hmm. These are the people who who put it on the ballot. These are the people who, who pushed for it. These are the people who were joy- dancing when it was uh, passed. Um, so they're saying, look, the majority of Californians voted for this. The governor is not doing his job. Somebody needs to speak up for the people. Somebody needs to speak up for us who put it on the ballot, who pushed it, and who got it and voted in favor of. Mm-hmm. A protect right. marriage, that's what it's called. Yeah. And, um, and they say, you know, and they've actually gotten, I can't remember who it was they were talking to, uh, uh, to defend it. I mean, it was a very good lawyer. Charles and, Cooper. Um, and uh, so they... Um, so it's gone to uh, – uh, uh, so they had a, a, a court case, the uh, California Supreme Court, to, to decide whether or not these people would be given standing in a federal appeals court. Mm-hmm. If they said, no, you don't have any right to do the sta- to sue, then they have no right to stand. But if this court says, yes, they have, we're, we're, they have every right to defend the law in California, then um, <clears throat> they'll be given standing by the, the federal court. And the lawsuit can move forward. 
Uh, now, Ted Olson, who, interestingly enough, worked in the, Ju- the George W. Bush administration, whose wife, by the way, died in the Twin Towers at 9-11. So there's our tie-in. Uh, you know, said, um, well, these sponsors are elected by no one. They take no oath to represent the people of California. Um, they have no authority to take over the attorney, attorney general's responsibility to represent the state. <coughs> and normally, I would agree with his argument. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other justices pretty much, the, the justices apparently pretty much disagreed with this. Um, uh, one of them said, look, if we deny this uh, to the official sponsors, well then, um, what purpose, what reason do we have a, a ballot initiative, uh, uh, statute in California? You know, the idea of the ballot initiative is that they can go around the, the legislature. And put in a law that the legislature may not want. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, in this case, adopting a constitutional amendment that the legislature wouldn't vote on, and the governor didn't want, but they went around him. So if you do, if you do that, but now you have a governor saying we don't, care, we're not going to enforce this, we're not going to fight for it. Well, then they they have to be given the right to. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, why let them do this? Yeah. Yeah, what's the point of having it in the first place? Right. As he said, he says, it, uh, you know, uh, the, the sponsors are not only entitled to represent the state and its voters, but also to protect and defend their right to propose uh, initiative and measures to the people. So the court's decision is due in 90 days, and it's just going to address the question of whether Protect Marriage has the right to appeal Judge Walker's ruling, will not address the validity of Prop 8, which the court upheld under state law in 2009, if that right is upheld of this uh, protect marriage to um, to appeal, then the federal appeals court will decide whether Prop 8 is constitutional and theoretically it could end up before the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, it's going to. No question about that. Eventually this whole issue uh, of gay marriage is going to because uh, it's going to come up under the Full Faith and Credit Act. Mm-hmm. It's going to come up with the question of, um, and I can't remember what I was reading about it today, where there's already a, a, a case that said that, uh, you know, state officials cannot be forced to um, recognize something. But I know, I mean, it's going to come up because, uh, oh, I know what it was. It was a case of a uh, uh, somebody in Louisiana, in another state, adopting a kid from a gay couple from another state, uh, elect, uh, uh trying to adopt a kid from Louisiana and Louisiana said we don't we don't recognize the marriage and so they sued the the, the guy the, the people in Louisiana saying you know you had no right to say you don't recognize the marriage the state does that kind of stuff it's going to come up mm-hmm. it's got to be uh, so they get to deal with that and eventually they're going to get to deal with uh, Obamacare but that's another story mm-hmm. so what we really need is a new message from God to tell us all the answers there you go and We've got a message. Man, okay. Um, yeah. God has a new prophet, according to Marshall Vion Summers, who, of course, is God's new prophet. It's convenient. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, he would know he's a prophet. Yeah. It's really he's great circular from, reasoning. <laughs> um, Colorado. And he said, the last prophet God sent to earth was Muhammad, and I'm the new one. So this guy, his his followers are going to gather in Estes Park for an encampment to explore the over 8,000 pages of revelations that Summer has has recorded over the past 20 plus years. So he's supposed to have, I I missed it. I was busy with Bible studies and things. Um, He was supposed to have a special message to be broadcast live on the internet for a $600 tuition fee. People attending the four day 2001 or our 2011 encampment, will learn about the five pillars of being a student of the new message from God. All right, here's the five pillars. But wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> how much would you pay to come if we can tell you, one, studying the extensive text and spiritual practices contained within the new message from God? And Gail has more. All right. Two, advocating for a unified world response to climate change, depletion of the Earth's resources, and the oppression of women and the poor. Three, 
spreading the new message from God to others. 4. Giving me more money. Tithing to the society for the new message from God. <laughs> and recognizing that Marshall V. and Summers is God's messenger. Now how much would you pay? <laughs> yeah, so i got to pay $600 for this guy to tell me to give him my money. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The annual encampment is the equivalent of the Islamic Hajj, except that at this historic gathering, God's messenger will actually be present. Mm -hmm. He says his revelations are not based on Christian or Muslim traditions, but they do state that Muhammad was the last messenger sent from God, that God's chosen to send a new messenger to deliver further revelation to humanity. When he was 33, he was met by the unseen ones and an angelic presence who guided him throughout the years. What? No golden plates written in reformed <laughs> Egyptian hieroglyphics? <laughs> yes. But they gave him some special red mushrooms with little white spots on them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I read this. And, oh, man. This is just... All right, Goof so nuts. a mysterious sequence of events led people to him. The first to find and join him was his wife, who supported him since 1983. Okay, the fact that she supports him is a bit mysterious, um, but probably the, the mysterious... Why is it mysterious? <laughs> what did we learn from L. Ron Hubbard? Yep, <laughs> you want to get rich, start a religion. <laughs> Right, I, you know, why, why, you know, yes, I believe in you. Where the, where the, where the bucks coming in? Oh, yeah. 600 bucks for each person who needs, who wants to come to this four day thing. And, 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 you know. and then you're, and then one of the main things you're going to teach him is to tithe to you. Oh, yeah, right. This sounds good. Where do I sign? I'm on the receiving <laughs> end of this. Ah, right. I like this God of yours. <laughs> yeah, I like the way this stuff works. Your worship. Um, your profitness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he actually does spell it P R O P H E T. Oh, hi. <laughs> not P R O F I T, which is, <laughs> I think that's a misprint. <laughs> oh, not only is he yeah, giving you the money, but recognizing that you're God's messenger, which, may, hey, maybe next year it'll be 15%. <laughs> God revealed to me <laughs> that you should double your and tithe. <laughs> And, and the funny thing reading this, this is, you know, uh, the spiritual practices contained in the new message, spreading the new message. No, so, 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 nowhere does it say what this new message is. Well, you got to pay $600 to find that out. I guess. Man, this is like Scientology, isn't it? I got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> it, boy, if, if I, you know, if we find out that you got to, Part of it is getting your engrams removed. <laughs> <laughs> Looking over the comments, oh, I like this. Is that uh, um, I find it ironic that students pay six hundred bucks to learn they must tie to this guy. It's kind of like paying to watch the advertisements. Ah, <laughs> oh, boy, <laughs> that monkey is going to pay. He's also been blessed with a son who's now chosen to join him in his mission. Well, I wonder why. <laughs> First of all, depending on how old the kid is, given that his he was got married in 1983 and the son came along sometime after that, right? So, depending on how old the kid is, if he grew up with this kind of thing, you know, like yeah. By the way, I'm, you know, God's messenger. Uh, okay, Dad, you know, like, I'm just a kid, what do I know, you know? Um, and then he, as time goes on, like, huh, this, this kind of works out pretty well for me. <laughs> I suppose I could probably be the I'll, successor. Although, huh? although the reality is L. Ron Hubbard's son actually became Christian and couldn't stand his father. His father was, you know, just horrible and uh, cheated on his mother and he wanted nothing to do with him. Uh, so maybe that can happen that he's good. He'll, he'll go back and go, that's, that's stupid. Uh, but uh, I don't, I, I, I don't even know what more to say. I mean, well, Hey, you know, it's eight, 8,000 pages. This is, you mentioned Obamacare before. This is way longer 
than the than the whole Obamacare thing. That was only like what two thousand pages. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Like, who's gonna read all that? Right, my Bible's just over a thousand pages. You know, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I don't read it, but like, how many Christians do? Right. Oh no. Okay. So, I yeah. So it says he's going to have a new message that he was going to give today. Okay. So I, I clicked on the link and went to newmessage.org. The new message from God. You ready? Broadcast postponed. <laughs> the broadcast of MV Summers at the 2011 encampment will be published here by Sunday the 18th. Our apologies for the last minute change. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, this is like Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Where he's like, where's your God? Was he, is he off sleeping? Did he, is he going to the bathroom? You gotta wait for him. You know? So, um, Prophet Summers, you need to do like yeah. the prophets of Baal did and, and like spear yourself and see if All that right. helps. I mean, reality is, this is, this is classic cult. That all of a sudden somebody has a new revelation that nobody's ever heard before. Um, and you, and he's the only one who's got it. And so you gotta listen to him and you gotta go to his special little camp and you gotta give him his special little money. And, uh, you know, then you do this and you're gonna learn something. You know, it's a brand new message. I mean, it's, it's classic cult stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's the one thing. If you read, I started rereading Lutheran Confessions again, like time number 36 through them, I think, or something like that. I can't remember how many times I've gone through them now. Uh, but it's amazing to me is how carefully they say, what we're saying is what the ancient church said. What we're saying is what Christians have always said. There's nothing new here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, what, what, what's happened within the Roman Catholic Church over the last few thousand years has been the, the, the variants. They're the ones who do something that's never been done before. But this is exactly what the church has always said. You know, as opposed to this idea of, oh, well, this is all brand new. We've never heard any of this stuff before. Nobody, nobody's heard of any of this. Although, golly, you know, we're really into what's cool right now because, of, you know, dealing with climate change and the depletion of Earth's resources. You know, like nobody's worried about that these days. Yeah, we've never heard anything about that. Right, that's a that's a brand new message that nobody's ever thought of. So at least he could be original, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know. A friend of mine, I remember a prof once said, "There is no such thing as new heresy. It's just you know old heresies repeated." So mm -hmm. I don't know. Or let's end it there tonight. Hey, we didn't. You know, have we gotten any mail the last two or three weeks? Um, just, you know, so we got a couple things from George like mm -hmm. reminding us that, um, giving us a really interesting article on Michelle Bachman. And then also he uh, reminded us that this is a, this is a really neat year for Lutherans in America. Um, cause, um, the, it's the 300th anniversary of Henry Muhlenberg, Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, who, uh, was kind of the patriarch of Lutheranism in America in the colon, in colonial America. And then a hundred years later, um, the found, one of the founding, uh, people in the Missouri Synod got by the name of Carl Ferdinand Wilhelm Walther. Uh, his birth, his 200th celebration of his birth is also this year. So if you're into that kind of stuff in uh, American history, uh, Lutheran, Amer American Lutheran history, uh, two very important people. Uh, Muhlenberg, by the way, his, um, he was extremely important. One of his sons was a Revolutionary War colonel and was in the, um, first uh, House of Representatives, later was a senator, and Peter Muhlenberg and his other son, I think his name is Franklin, uh, was the first speaker in the U.S. House of Representatives. Hmm. Man, now there's hardly any Lutherans in the <laughs> government. Oh, there's a few of them up there, a few of them in the, uh, 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 in, in the Senate and in the uh, U.S. House. So, so oh, thanks for the information. It's some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. 
So, well, hopefully now we'll be able to get back onto a little better schedule. Um, although, you know, you just never know. So, life happens. Yeah, yeah, it does. So, someday we'll be, you know, famous and people will be dumping tons and tons of money so that, um, you know, we can do this stuff and, and, yeah. Okay, maybe not. So <laughs> you're just yeah, going to have to deal with so, it. You know, happening in this congregation. Hey, everybody, God be with you. God give you good grace. Uh, remember to keep our first responders and our soldiers in our prayers, especially as we remember uh, the events of 10 years ago. God watch over, be with you, bless you, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night, everybody. God bless. Amen.